Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Unspoken Truths Part 4 of Being Black in America. I'm so excited to have Sasha and Nakia with me tonight. Uh, as you all have been hopefully paying attention, that every week we have been releasing a um, a clip of us having conversations with uh, different panelists to really talk about what their experiences have been in being Black in America. Super excited about having these two lovely women with me. Um, I have a shared experience with them as being part of a the George Mason alumni. Um, <clears throat> just community and you all being recipients of the scholarship while I was still um, at the university from a, a, a president chapter perspective and from just a nomination perspective. So super, super excited to hear this conversation tonight. I am offering, oh, tonight, day, whatever time you guys are listening to. <laughs> um, and so I'm just would like for both of you to just share a little bit about yourself with our audience. Okay, I'll go first. Um, uh, my name is Sasha Pierre Louis, and I'm a recent graduate from with my master's degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I really focus on job searching and how Black women navigate the workplace. So I'm really interested in online communities and how we use that as an alternative space to find jobs because of um, traditional networking spaces where you may be in a I guess like a really corporate jobs, you may sometimes as a black woman feel left out of that. So using other sources to sort of build those networks and communities to learn about opportunities. So I'm really happy to be here and share my experiences. Awesome, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Nakia Ridgway. I am also a recent graduate uh, from George Mason University. I graduated in 2017. I um, took about three years off, um, and then I started law school at West Virginia University College of Law, where I am currently a 1L. All right. Congratulations and welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I feel like I sound like Carolina Kitchen, but anyway. So, <laughs> but I'm so excited. So, as you think about your experiences as Black women, in 2021, right? We're only in February, but 2020 was a hell of a year. And so when we think about 2020 and your experiences up to this point, what are some things that you would like to share with our audience? I would say I, I, I saw 2020 as an opportunity for growth in a lot of different ways. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, you know, we're, we were all forced to be inside. And so that really forced me to one, slow down and two, to really be intentional about the things that I'm doing um, personally, professionally. And so I think, I think it was a blessing in disguise in a sense, but at the same time, um, I think in conjunction with being, you know, with having the pandemic, it forced people to really Russell with things that are happening in the country dealing with with, with black people that maybe you that they didn't have the opportunity to think about or not even that but they you know weren't really forced to really consider and so I think it was a year or two for people to 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 take a step back and actually see what's going on um, and what has been going on for for centuries in this country but because how this country set up you know is never really brought to the forefront so I think um, I, th I think 2020, you know, did a lot of things, but I, th I think for, for most of the country, it really shined a light on what needed to be highlighted. Yeah, I would say for me too, it was sort of a time to slow down and really get close to people who are already in my tight knit community. Just being, again, intentional about reaching out to people um, I consider myself a traveler, so like for me, some things were taken out of my control, like having all of these different trips planned, and it just made me reflect on like, sometimes you don't, or yeah, you don't have control over what's going to happen, so you can really plan as much as you would like to, or 
you do as a person, but sometimes things are going not going to work and just being flexible and open to change, I think is something that I really got to like focus on this year um, as someone who likes to explore uh, really taking a step back and just spending more time with my family, um, exploring like my neighborhood, picking up different activities like jogging and just really trying to be, I guess, more centered is what I really took from this past year with so much um, going on around the world um, and in the United States. Um, I often follow like international news, specifically in the Caribbean region. So just seeing like the diaspora, like really come in support um, the things that are happening in Black America was something that I felt was really inspiring and also made me like think about that the U.S. is not just the U.S. Like we impact so many people, um, even as Black Americans, like our culture, our news really, really influences other parts of the world. So I think if anything, not only planning, but being intentional about what it means to be um, not only a Black American, but like a U.S. citizen with all of the, I guess, things that come with that. I think that that's really powerful, right? Like to remember that we are in living in a country that is looked at amongst others as a goal, right? And as a space for aspiration. And unfortunately, our history always isn't always reflective of that same projection that others see. And so mm -hmm. there's this view that the US is like <laughs> laced with streets of milk and honey and that there is no poverty. And, and it's like, oh, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and so I think that that's really powerful to, to just rethink about intentions, right? And, and to reconsider about just slowing down and, and being in a space like that. And so when you think about your own experiences as being Black women, what is it that you have found to be both challenging as you both have are in the market for, we're looking for jobs at some point, right? Mm -hmm. And I know Sasha, that's something that you focus on as well. Um, and Nakia in starting law school, right? I know that that had been a journey for you. And so tell us a little bit about your experiences as much as you would like to share, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, so I guess to, to focus more on my my law school journey, um, I for me it was it was important for me to make sure I was doing what I wanted to do. Essentially, like I felt a lot of pressure from my parents, uh, from other you know others in my community in my circle who um, were like, "You need to go to law school right now, like right after you graduate." And I'm like, "Yeah, I probably should," but I really wasn't making that decision for myself. And so um, getting to that point to where I felt comfortable making that decision was um, a little shaky in that um, some money was spent in, in the meantime for LSAT classes, for the actual LSAT. You know, I took multiple tests, uh, took multiple classes, um, trying to figure out at what point, you know, I, I was ready to go to law school. So um, I think for me, it, it was, it was a, I had to be uh, honest with myself and have to just be honest with the people that I love that I know this is what you want for me, but I don't necessarily want this for myself, not at this, this moment in time. And so I think that that taught me a lot of, a lot about myself and um, having to sometimes, you know, cut, draw the line and say, you know, this is, this is something I'm, I'm doing for myself. Um, my parents aren't going to law school. My friends aren't going to law school. I'm the one who's going to be going through that. Um, and so wanting to, you know, make sure that it was intentional um, and make sure that the investment was was worth it at the time that I decided to 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 start. And then uh, Shante, to uh, touch on your point about the international like aspect about the U.S. Um, 
I, so when I was in University of Oxford, I studied abroad there and I was there in 2016, um, the fall of 2016 and there during the election. And one, I mean, it was just an amazing experience to be out of the country, but, but it's particularly with the election cycle. And I remember uh, the day after um, the president was elected in 2016, I was walking down the street and one of my classmates who's from a different country, she saw me and she said, Nakia, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, what's, what's going on? She's like, I heard the news. <laughs> I was like, what, what, what news are we talking about? Um, and she's like, no, I heard what happened in, in, in the US. I heard he got elected. I was like, yeah, I know. She's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine, but it's just like I'm just I'm just worried because I know like what that means, and it took me a minute to like to really understand like the I guess the gravity of that moment. But being in a different country, still a U.S. citizen, but interacting with somebody from a different country, seeing all of this happen mm -hmm. in the U.S., you know, I just it just kind of it made sense to me that this was it was bigger than just the U.S. Like this impacted everybody because, like you said, the U.S. is seen as the model country and with the model, you know, government and, and model leadership. Um, but when that happened in 2016, people were like, well, this is something not right here. Um, so I just, I, but it was just, amongst other experiences in Oxford, that was one of the ones that where I kind of got a, a different perspective as a, as a citizen of the United States, um, but from like a global, a global aspect. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Sasha, you're about, I see you about to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, can you just restate the question again? I just want to make sure. I'm... <laughs> or what were we, what's the topic? I want to make sure I'm on the right track. You know, I believe in rolling with the flow. So if there's okay. something that is on yeah. your spirit and on your heart, I, go with that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I really like the point that Nakia made about boundaries. And I think for Black women, that's sometimes something that we, I guess, try to, for like a better world, word be the mule for everybody, or we're seen as like, oh, give her the problems, she'll help you, superwoman strength. And I think that can really wear down on you because then it's like, are you making decisions for yourself? Are you being happy for yourself? Or are you trying to please other people um, in the opportunity? And I just feel like, um, at least for Black women, some of us may, I guess, realize that too late, too late, like later in life. And I think for me, I just want Black women to always um, think of themselves first, even if it may hurt people they love in the short term, because um, you know, your community, if they're really for you, they'll understand and they'll, they'll understand and they'll eventually come around, especially if you have that open communication with them. Um, I, I really believe in Black women having their own personal growth, our own journey that's ours and not really um, anyone else's. And I think oh, at least that came to me um, maybe like a few years ago, but I really, um, really think this is kind of nerdy, but I really think the books that I read for like open me, opening me up to like, what does it mean to be black? And what does it mean to be a woman? There's so many ways. And so just seeing like, I guess through characters, like how they go about dealing with their friendships and families, it has like opened my eyes to like, you know, making decisions for myself. Um, even with my mom, like she's very influential um, in my life, she's like, you know, your life is your own. Um, do things because you want to do them, not because like you want to please me or like you want to make your family, make other family members happy. Like you're all that matters. Like once we're gone, you know, I can't live your life for you. So I always think about that um, whenever, I, whenever I'm making a decision, uh, just always doing things that make me happy. And I really liked what uh, Nakia said about, you know, if I want going to school and then just making sure that's something that you really, that I really want to do, or you really want to do. Um, I would even say like, I kind of see that now, um, like I wanted to go to a doctoral program, but I needed this break or I need this break. So just settling. And then when I'm ready, 
you know, to go back and apply, that's when um, I'll be able to do that. So I really appreciate that point that you made. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, thank you both for sharing that because, uh, and that's one of the things I love about your generation. <laughs> and I, I think theoretically we're in the same bucket, but I'm on a different spectrum than you guys are. So, you know, whatever. But <laughs> I love this piece of the generation, right? And that's because you all have this sense of, I am who I am. And you might not love it or like it all the time, but this is me, right? And you all infuse it <laughs> into the culture and you all carry it with such a confidence that I just, I, I just love because there are so many Black women who carry this weight of superwoman and all the pieces that come along with that baggage of carrying other people's stuff and our own <laughs> and the pressures of wanting to go to law school, wanting to go do your doctorate program, wanting to create platforms for people and, right, and, and, and. And so I, I think I just, I'm appreciative of mm -hmm. it, you know, and I hope that there are other Black women and women who are listening to this at some point and that hear that we have choice, right? And in that choice, we have the option to really sit down and to be ourselves. But we got to do some digging and understand what is it that we want, right? Because I heard Nakia say, I had to, I was doing all these things, but I, did, I didn't want to do it just yet. I didn't want to go to law school just yet. If you were on the outside looking in, you didn't know that because <laughs> Nakia was putting in some work. <laughs> it was internal. It was internal struggle. <laughs> you know, and so I, I just, I, I appreciate both of you sharing that experience. Um, I think also too, um, in addition to that, you have to be okay with, with not doing what other people want you to do or being okay with, maybe upsetting some people um, because that was the biggest thing for me. My mom and my dad are, you know, similar to Sasha, two of my biggest supporters and, and have big influences over my life. And I, I value their opinions and their advice. And I'm like, okay, well, they're telling me this, maybe I should. And then I'm just like, I don't really know, but maybe I should, cause they said it cause they're my parents. And, but I just had to be comfortable with, they're just not gonna like this. <laughs> like, and that's, that's how it's gonna have to be because I just am not, it doesn't sit right with me to start right now. Um, but then, but I think Sasha mentioned it earlier, if they are true supporters and really love you, then they'll be okay with that. They'll support you either way, which is, you know, what they did. So, um, so yeah, you just gotta be, you gotta be willing to, to take the, the road less traveled and the road less, I guess, supported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so, because I, I would be remiss not to, to bring this up. So I, when I opened this up, I said that the three of us were graduates of George Mason. And um, I think that, I know both of you had an, an, an interesting experience at Mason. Mm -hmm. um, Sasha, I know you led away in your senior year <laughs> for some radical change um, at Mason and really bringing up some things that I think aren't just a university perspective, but a global perspective and a, a national perspective about how we have to use our voices, right? Mm -hmm. And I know Nakia, you, you picked up parts of that torch where um, Sasha had left, but it was um, for me, when I saw the passion that you had for your civic duty, for not just yourself, but for your community and wanting justice, right? And so when you think about your civic duty, we have a soon to be lawyer with us, um, Senator, VP, whatever, President, I'm ready. I'm claiming it. I'm putting it out there. Um, don't forget about me. But <laughs> when you think about 
what you were doing in college to what you're doing now, how do you elevate your voices and others' voices in what we call justice? Yeah, I would say that um, my time at Mason really laid the foundation for like how I stand up for myself now. Um, I Looking back, I realized like college and university life is really one of the only times you'll be able to basically participate in protests, like just do all sorts of things with some sort of like immunity in some case. I mean, of course not breaking the law, but like just speaking out in a way that you, at least at Mason, because I know that's not the case at all university campuses, but just being able to speak out about injustice and maybe not worrying about, um, I guess, a fear for your life in the same way that we see some people protesting now. Um, so. I think having the university experience is really important in finding your voice and just learning your style to understanding how you're going to take on justice, whether that's protesting, organizing, strategically helping behind the scenes. So, you know, maybe you're not a front line person, but you will help create some flyers and make sure people have food. Um, and who are the people on campus or you might need to talk to behind seeds to get your um, point across. So I think that was university life was really important in finding how I was going to stick up uh, for myself and how I was going to um, basically interact in the workplace um, is really what I mostly appreciate, appreciate looking back on my time at Mason is just or university in general, just having like all these sorts of experiences that I'm able to do uh, without so much of the same sort of, I guess, backlash you might get um, not on a university campus. Mm. And again, that's campus depending because history has shown otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would echo Sasha. And I, um, I feel that Mason, there was a lot of opportunity to be civically active. Um, and I think we saw at least in like my four years and the three years that Sasha was, you know, we overlapped. Um, we saw a lot of students being civically active, like wh whether that was protesting in the middle of campus or, uh, you know, hosting events that raised awareness on particular um, issues. I know like for the Honors College, we did um, an event on George Mason and his slaves, which is a narrative we don't hear about um, and we only hear about George Mason, the founder and the writer of this document, the writer of that document, but we never talk about him as a slave owner. Um, and so being able to have the platform that I think we had at Mason um, to be able to do these things was pivotal in, I think, in, in all of us growing as young professionals, young students who were trying to find, like Sasha said, you're trying to find, you know, your, your voice and, and, you know, actually start to develop um, an advocacy aspect of yourself. Um, and that's something that I appreciated about my time at Mason. Wow, that's awesome. It's so interesting because I didn't have that, I didn't find that voice at Mason it, while I was a student. It wasn't until I was part of the alumni chapter, the Black alumni chapter, where my advocacy from a support perspective from the background really came out. Um, and then when I became the president, it was even more in my face <laughs> of, oh, I got to be the front person for this. And so um, I think that it's important for people to hear that they're campus dependent. <laughs> there are opportunities just in general, though, to find your voice, right? And to, to find how you're going to walk in this space, Um to on the path on the journey to find out who you are. So I, I thank you both for sharing that. I guess I can add to that too. Like, like even though I came to campus as sort of this motivated person, I do not think I could do it without some of the faculty and staff um, that I met. So it not only took me getting out of my shell or just reaching out to people, but really finding those um, professional staff members and other types of university support who could sort of, um, I guess, back me up 
if I needed them to. And I think that's really important to any type of community work or organizing or standing up for yourself. Um, you, you really have to have like a solid support team, even if in the future you, you may sort of like what we were talking about earlier, let them down in some sense because they didn't see you going down a certain path. But just having a strong um, support group that I know I could talk about things with um, really helped me, I guess, be a part of those different things that were happening on campus. Mm. Yeah. And that is leading me to this space that I, because I know that it's a conversation across predominantly white universities in general is the representation and what students see from a professor perspective, from a dean perspective, from just a faculty and staff perspective. And I'm wondering how, if any, impact the lack of representation had on you and your experience at the university. Um, I think I take more of a lean in approach. So I guess looking back, I can go like, wow, when I was taking those classes, there were not a lot of Black people, Black support. But um, I think seeking out those net networks while I was on campus, I can't say 100% that I noticed that there was a lack um, just because I really believe in leaning in into like my community. So I guess for me, like even though it was in the back of my mind that this was happening, I had such a strong, I guess, presence of, you know, people that looked like me that it did not impact me in a negative way socially. Now, academically, uh, looking back, that was, that was, I can, my last few years, um, I think having the lack of um, professor support um, from Black professors, um, if I did have that support, I think I would have been further along in my, uh, I guess, career journey. And I know that because like even research shows that um, Black people, Black women who have sponsors, you know, those people who stick up for them, they're more likely to go further along in their career journey. So. Um, I think looking back, um, I could see that now if I had those stronger academic ties to maybe a black sociology, um, excuse me, a black psychology professor, just someone in my academic space, I think I would have gone a lot further um, from that perspective. But socially and like growing professionally, um, I think I had that community. I would agree with Sasha. Uh, most of my classes um, and most of my professors were white. Um, I was uh, blessed with a professor, uh, Professor Wendy Manuel Scott, um, which is like the 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 go to for all African African American studies anything. Um, so I, I was thankful to have a class with her, but I wish I would have had more classes, um, honestly, because of just um, being able to have a different perspective that comes with having a black professor. Now she's not the only black professor at Mason or wasn't at the time, but um, I, I wish I would have taken more of those uh, classes. And, but that, that goes to your point of the lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. um, but in my, pro, my major program, I was a conflict analysis and resolution major. Um, th there weren't many black professors, but there were professors of other ethnicities, of other cultures. So I was able to get, um, I guess, a more international kind of um, flavor or influence uh, in my classes, um, which was which was nice to to not just have, you know, all white professors. Uh, but similar to Sasha, I found my community outside of the classroom. So I went to class. I had my, you know. To have classes, to work, and then I'd go to my friends, which who were majority black. Um, I was a part of BSA. I was a part of um, a sorority, you know. So I, all of my social interactions, most of them were um, with black students, um, black staff, um, bl offices that help support those organizations. So I kind of found that niche there. Um, but like I said, I think I still was able to benefit from some of 
of, of diversity within the faculty, but um, would have liked to have seen more, um, particularly like black professors. Mm. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting. I'm listening to you all talk about your experiences and I literally had to think back and outside of African-American studies, I did not have a black or brown professor, mm. whether it be adjunct or tenured. <laughs> And, and I was a comm major. So when I think back to that, and you know, Sasha, you made a really good point around having advocacy, women having advocacy and what it does for us. And I remember my senior year in one of my comms classes, one of my professors, his name is escaping me, but I will have to go back and look at this paper to find out his name, but he wrote on it, you should consider going to grad school. Mm. I had never even thought about going to grad school. It was not on my list of things to do. <laughs> I just wanted to graduate. <laughs> I wanted to graduate in my four years, but that seed that he planted with me had me thinking, huh, well, what would I do for grad school? Like, what would that look like? And I think that it's one of the reasons why I stayed so in touch with the Mason community when I left was because I didn't get that till my senior year. I recognized the power that it had and I wish that I had gotten that type of seed being planted in encouragement earlier. And like you all, sometimes I forgot I was at a predominantly white <laughs> university because the 4% of us were like always around. <laughs> and, you know, and so that experience is one that I'll never, I, I would never want to take back because I had such a good time and I learned so much about not just myself, but about human dynamics and about how we interact and interplay. I do wish that there was more advocacy for the black and the brown students on campus though, um, which is why obviously I have, participated in the activities and the things that I have on campus, even after I graduated. Um, so when we talk about advocacy and sponsorship, right, we have law school, <laughs> we have getting ready, preparing for doctorate school once ready. <laughs> what does or what has advocacy and sponsorship done for you to this point? It's done a lot um, for me, especially in the, in the journey of, of getting to law school and having those conversations with um, other black women who are attorneys and trying to figure out like what my plan is, even questioning if I'm even like ready for law school, am I just in, in over my head um, and and then, you know, connecting with those women, but also like them connecting with other women who are like, hey, I have this, this uh, student who is interested in law school. Can you talk to her? Then I connect with them and then they connect me to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and all, all with the purpose of supporting me. Um, and that's, that kind of support was really instrumental in me getting to law school. And then even now that I'm in law school, um, there's there's about uh, 10 or so black students in the entire law school. I'm the only black woman in my, my class. Um, I have found the support in black women at the law school. Um, there's not very many of them, but I have found support in all of them and that they recognize that we are a minority of a minority. We're double minority at the school. There's about five of us and um, and they just like pour into me. Like I, I, I talked to one today who was just like, Hey, how, how's it going? How's interviews going? How's this? How's that? How's that? I was telling her about interviews and this and that. And she's like, Hey, I think you should talk to this attorney. She works here. And I think she'd be able to help you with this text me or put us both on a, on a text chain right then and there. I'm talking with her tomorrow. Like, and, and that sort of, um, just, support and community I was not really expecting coming to West Virginia, um, especially at the law school. Um, but being able to to benefit from that and, and it honestly I think it's somewhat of a blessing that it is a small number of us because 
that forms a tight knit community. Like it, like we, we're all we have, mm-hmm. and the professor, the two professors that we have, and um, the the two um, staffers who are black women um, have really been like intentional about making sure that I feel connected, that I have what I need, um, that I'm connected to who I need to be connected to. Um, so they, they've really been advocates, uh, for me, um, especially I have, I have a mentor through a program who, um, is an attorney and she went to the law school, but now, you know, she's, she doesn't work at the law school anymore. She's just an alum. And so, um, she knew I was applying for a judge, uh, a judicial internship and she knew the judge and she knew the clerk and she made a phone call and I applied. I mean, it, so she really was like really pivotal for um, for opportunities. She calls sponsorship. Someone who can show up and make things happen. Yes. And I met her maybe like end of last semester. And she was just like, put me down as a reference. Tell me who, oh, you're applying for this one? Okay, I'll connect you with somebody who used to work there. Or oh, you're applying for this one? Uh, okay, let me see. Look, uh, I'll connect you to somebody else. Like she just really, and I wasn't expecting it because I just met her, but but just having that camaraderie and that just community and and, and wanting to support me um, has been really refreshing um, at the law school. Mm. Yeah. And look at that energy that came out when you <laughs> were talking about this level of support. Oh. I was not expecting it. I I was I mean, if, given the fact that we're West Virginia one, but two, um, I'd like to say I'm the only only black woman in my class, so <laughs> there's not very many of us uh, to get that support from. So the fact that there is a community already, and I've, it's only my second semester, um, is is really exciting. Yeah, I love to hear that, Sasha. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of like where I found support at Mason. Um, I, th- I mean, there were a few people, but I think someone who like really influenced, like, yes, was uh, Dr. Lenitra Berger. Um, I had met her through um, another faculty and staff member who worked in the multicultural office, and he knew I wanted to study abroad. And he was like, "You should come on this day and talk to Dr. Berger." And just seeing her do what she does it just like influenced, like it's inspired me. Like, I didn't even know that resource was available to me because um, she mostly worked with the honors college students at the time. So I just, I just didn't know. So just to have that connecting piece, I think is like really important and just staying connected with her um, after graduating, asking her like, how do you apply to grad school? Because um, even though I'm not a first generation college student, you know, I'm one of the first people in my family to go to graduate school. So, I mean, just having someone who already went through that process was really helpful to like get a head start or just to understand the process of applying. And then, of course, um, always taking, always doing my own research, using social media to my benefit. Like I said earlier, I'm really interested in online communities and how that network supports people to their next level. So even using my social media to connect with other first time grad students or grad students who are already in grad school was really like really helpful because even though I may have been one of the few black students in my program, I still felt like I had like an army of people supporting me, um, whether I knew them or not. So I think that's uh, really important. And even as I went through graduate school, um, having only one black uh, woman professor, and she is, she is, I would arguably say the top at the top of her game and only going further up because um, just the work that she has done has really been inspiring. Like um, I may not always be able to contact her, um, which is, I find that is not unlike other black women who are at the top of their game. Um, Like you may not always be able to access them, but when you need them, they will show up and they will show up big. And so I really appreciate um, just having those like sort of like, I know they're there when I really need them 
let me reach out and they'll help me to the best of my ability. And then also taking matters um, into my own hands and using like what's available to me to sort of foster my own community. Yeah, I think that that's really powerful, right? Being able to discern when to reach out to those connections and those powers that be, because it's, um, I, I, I tell my mentor or my mentees this a lot, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. I wanna help you. However, when you keep coming to the bank and always drawing <laughs> and drawing and withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing, Right. You've got to put something back. And it, sometimes it's as simple as saying, hey, I know you're busy. I've been researching X, Y, Z. What do you think about this? It's like, oh, they thought about it already. Like, this is great. This is great. That's such a great point. That's such a great point. Yeah. Because the joy of someone coming to you, whether how busy you are, for me, it's like, okay, damn, I, I know this. <laughs> right I do I, I know this I've been doing this for a while I know this but the joy of what happens on the other end to watch right and so my acts of you all will always be don't forget that, that someone helped you and that you as a responsibility have that same responsibility to help someone else right? because that community can't stop just because you have gotten to wherever you were trying to go in that moment, right? And so I think that there's culturally, sometimes we build a community for us and we don't necessarily think about those outer networks and other people that need some support, right? And so the same energy, Nakia, that you were giving when somebody that you barely knew were like, yeah, let me, let me contact you with somebody. Somebody else, somewhere else, at some other point in your life is going to need you to be her, mm. right? And Sasha, similar to you with that same journey I've had, right? I wasn't the first to go to college in my family. I was one of the first to go to graduate school. I had no idea what it looked like though. Right. And so I, perp and I didn't know the different resources that were available to me in undergrad to help me flush some of that out. And so just when we talk about intention, like at the beginning of this conversation, continuing to be intentional about everything that we do, right? And making sure that as women and black women, we are taking care of each other from a perspective of what do you want and need from me in order to be able to support you, right? So as we wind down for the evening, what would you all like to leave our audience with? Um, yeah, I think uh, sort of to some of those um, points that I was making in the beginning is uh, really try to live for yourself first because, um, you know, we can, I feel like the best way we can be great mentors is to make sure that we're all not all together, but we have our stuff and we're happy so that we're able to, you know, make sure the next generation is able to be as successful or even more successful um, than, than we are. I'm not saying like be rude or, you know, not respond to people, but having that open communication being like, hey, I really can't help you right now, but here's someone who can I mean, then when you feel that you are able to help people, um, then you're able to help. So I think for Black women, especially, um, just putting yourself first um, and not taking on everyone else's needs before your own. Yeah, I would agree with Sasha um, in, in doing life for you, um, but also, do not um, self-sabotage mm -hmm. um, in the sense that I know for myself, I, I tend to overthink a lot of things. And especially when it comes to like applying for things, I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm probably not going to get that. So I don't apply for it or I don't put my hat into the rings. I think I'm not qualified for it. 
Um, whereas, Are you talking to me, Nakia? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I mean, because there's people who are, but there's people who are out there applying for things they're not qualified for. Right. <laughs> but you don't know until you try, right? Like you don't don't take your your hat out the ring before the it even begins, because you're definitely not going to get it then. Um, right. and I mean, I've learned through experience. I was like, I'm probably not going to get this. I'm going to apply, see what happens, mm-hmm. and God bless that it happened. So I mean, it it. it it doesn't hurt, I don't think, in my opinion, to, um, to to do those things. And you just never know until you actually take that leap of faith and, and do it. Come on through, leap of faith. <laughs> Come on through. <laughs> Come on through believing in self. Come on through. And that's so real. And <laughs> women tend to not apply for a job if they don't think that they have 100% of the qualifications in the job description, where men will apply if they have less than 50%. Yeah. They're not qualified, but guess what? They apply. And so, and nine times out of 10, the women that are looking at that skill set have more than enough of the qualifications to even get their resume onto the right desk. And so for women and not just black women, but for women, it is a belief in our self-worth and being able to show up, not just the way that we think internally, but externally so that we have that confidence as we're applying for those jobs, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm just so thankful for you all. And this word, this is so good for me this evening, day, whatever time somebody's watching it. (laughs) So I appreciate you all. Um, I appreciate our audience for listening and hanging in there with me. Um, I hope that you all are getting all of this great information that has been coming your way. And if you're looking for anything, you can always find me on my YouTube channel, on my podcast, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. You know how to find me. So mybestshift.com, that's us. So thank you. And always, 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 always love you and have a great day.